Welcome to another great episode of Architect Tomorrow. I'm really pleased to have Mina Frost back again. It's been a while, actually, at least a year, I think, hasn't it, Mina, since we were talking about health tech previously. So thanks, thanks for returning. And I'm really pleased to also be joined by Sanjay Joshi, a very seasoned professional in the health tech space. Mina, you and I were talking about the Health um, Tech 100, weren't we? Uh, well, 150, sorry. And I, I was sort of curious to see what your sort of take was on it and whether you felt there was anything that was missing or sort of underrepresented? Yeah, um, well, you know, it's a great um, overview of, of a given year, the kinds of companies that are making advancements um, across health, te- health tech. Um, I think oftentimes you find that the things that are getting the most airtime and progressing the quickest are the ones that are better funded for obvious reasons. Um, so I think that there is um, a good amount of shift from in a couple of areas. So I think the rise of femtech has become a big um, space for, for funding, uh, though I'm not entirely sure that female funder uh, founders are getting as well funded as perhaps that they should, uh, whether that's in femtech or in another area. Um, I've seen a shift towards rare diseases Um, So just really pushing into precision medicine, um, a lot of genomic work uh, in that space, trying to help people find very, very specific solutions to very rare diseases. Um, And I've also seen a shift in towards the decentralization of clinical trials. I think this whole COVID process and the drive to vaccines has... I think open people's eyes to the fact that the drug cycle life cycle does not actually need to be the sort of rote 20 year mm. um, journey that it has been for the last century, but rather there are ways to accelerate that. Um, and one of them, uh, one of the most impressive things around the development of the COVID vaccines was how quickly they were able to get up trials it, up and running. Almost mean alike, maybe some of the agile sort of digital philosophy has been Absolutely. applied to vaccine development. It's, it's interesting as well, you're saying about sort of looking at rare diseases, because I'm hearing of all kinds of sort of stuff, you know, as a layperson, I'm not, I'm not a health uh, specialist by any means, like the pair of you are, but, um, you know, he- hearing that kind of the techniques and sort of new sort of ways that, that we were, that have been researched through COVID are now being applied to other, you know, hard to treat illnesses so uh, sort of fascinating what the kind of innovation I suppose it's sort of unlocked absolutely and it's innovation that I think has always sort of been latent obviously in science and in biomedical research but it's the pace and the agility as you say that I think is um, being approached novelly uh, these days Sanjay is there anything about the health tech 150 to you that sort of stood out or anything you're sort of tracking at the moment? Yeah, I'm, let me take the other side of the fence, Ollie. Um, we're, we're both in cybersecurity. Uh, Visual Health and Health Tech Health Effect received three times the start of funding um, as that of cybersecurity, which is on everybody's mind nowadays. Um, but the uh, big company approach, I mean, most of the large companies instituting um, these uh, uh, incubators uh, out of very specialized cities that have been done good. Of course, Boston, um, uh, Massachusetts is kind of the mecca for biotech. So a lot of good folks have been there. But you're seeing the springing up of uh, multiple uh, incubators across the world. Um, and I'm seeing uh, this large investment in um, traditionally folks that have invested in, um, in healthcare, but have been diver- diversified for companies like Siemens and Philips, for example. Um, they, are, they put all their eggs in the healthcare basket as well in terms of both digital health and, um, and traditional um, instrument devices. So, so that's the one area that I'm seeing quite a bit of. Mina, going, going back to female sort of representation of sort of... Um female sort of health sort of challenges and I sort of see this as an extension of the general unwinding of sexism I suppose that has has effectively you know institutional sexism which has probably led also to the fact that that female health issues just aren't prioritized because of of sort of you know uh, the lack of female leadership in in some of these organizations is that 
is that something that you've kind of seen? I think on the on the broader side, or, or and maybe also on a slightly more positive side, I think it's the growth of the diversity and inclusion mm-hmm. agenda, because as much as I, you know, have specifically mentioned um, femtech and female founders, we're also talking about minority owned found, you know, minority owned businesses and founders. Um, so lots of different kinds of diversity and inclusion efforts. And we certainly have seen in clinical trials, the desperate need for biotech and pharmaceutical companies to be able to recruit a more diverse clinical trial population in order to further support their endpoints, safety, efficacy, all of those things. And that's a real issue um, in clinical trial recruitment. I think on the female specific side, health side of things, I think, yeah, there's probably a bit of patriarchy that's that's lingering around what is reimbursed, what is paid for, what is of interest um, with uh, men's health versus women's health. I also think, um, uh, there's a company called Hertility here in London, um, and they are doing a fantastic campaign called the Mother of All Movements. Um, and they've recently put an, a, a video out about how complicated actually women's health ha- is and how difficult um, it, uh, you know, and nuanced it is to, to sort of diagnose and understand and treat. Uh, not unlike in some ways um, neuro uh, as a field, Um, You know, treating Alzheimer's, treating, I mean, there's so many times that the pharmaceutical industry and biotech industry have made a massive run at that and just fallen back over because it's the brain is so complicated and difficult to deal with. And it sort of feels like the same a little bit with women's health is that it's, it's hard and the barriers to entry are are high. Uh, So we'll go for the lower hanging fruit. But I think there's a, a real turn, I think, uh, certainly in the innovation. And now we just need to see a turn in the funding. And I was I, fascinated by the statistic that you called out um, of the report that said that women are actually 76 percent more likely than men to have visited a doctor within the past year. I just thought, and I guess when you kind of think about it and, and the sort of family reasons that are given as women being the sort of primary caretakers and, and, and doing appointments for children and so on, that kind of makes sense. Because if I think about my household, it's probably my wife that has you know taken the kids to the doctor more 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 than I have. But it's just sort of you know fascinating when you kind of see data points like, like that that drive the need for, for, for this sure. sort of shift. And sure. I just and it's, a few oh, things from a biology perspective. Uh, by the way, we're all born girls for the first six seconds of life. Um, there's a massive switching go- that goes on by the X chromosome. Which, so the Y chromosome is a shrimp. It's only about 70 genes, seven zero. And by the way, the Y chromosome, the male chromosome has been shrinking for the last 40,000 years. The female chromosome, the X chromosome is 2,100 genes. Um, so uh, if nothing else, women are 30 times more complicated than men. Men are just simple oafs, as they say. And, <laughs> and uh, there is a, there is a, delinea- there is a uh, progressive linear declination in the Y chromosome. And there's a theory that in about a million or so years, there won't be any men left. And all the women go, yay. And uh, <laughs> uh, that's one part. So uh, I think understanding that women give birth in upset and men don't, um, is very important to understand. Uh, the other part is, uh, from a precision medicine perspective, um, you know, uh, dialing back clinical trials, it was all old white men that were in clinical trials, no matter where you were, um, because most large pharma companies are, are built that way. But, um, but uh, specifically in precision medicine, pardon the pun, um, the, the, uh, um, the, let's say the whole genome sequences in, uh, worldwide, uh, 70% were of Northern European origin. And um, this was, I'm talking two years ago. Um, that number has not changed. And even the, 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 um, the warnings that people are saying that, yeah, great, every, all the wealthy nations are vaccinated. What about the rest of the world? Yeah. And um, um, when I studied um, <laughs> immunology, they said, you know, um, there, there are about 350 quadrillion viruses falling off uh, the atmosphere every day. So, um, you know, these things are an envelope we don't understand. So, yeah, sorry about that. But it is important to understand this. It makes me wonder, actually, whether the next piece of innovation in vaccine technology is actually in the manufacturing. How to scale. Um, I would have never realized that mRNA vaccines would be a platform. Um, By the way, this was studied in Seattle 20 years ago. 
Um, and um, uh, some of these folks were looking at small interfering RNA and uh, uh, MRNA uh, messenger, messenger RNAs and, and now uh, RNA as a platform, uh, it, the complexity is in the manufacturing. I think the cold chain was the, uh, was the supply chain that was attacked because the patents in the cold chain on how do you transfer mRNA platforms from um, the manufacturing, which is an extremely complex process into the arm of someone. That is where most of the patents are. So not to digress the issue, but yeah. So uh, I would say cancer vaccines are around the corner now, now that mRNA platforms work and, and rare disease as well. I have to say though, it's interesting because Sanjay brought it up earlier about Boston being sort of a, um, a foothold for biotech. I think what's really interesting is the rise and the increased funding, which is where I think most of the Delta has been in the increase in funding and health of tech bio. So not necessarily your traditional biotech who, all, who follow a sort of pharma model, but rather sort of a more Silicon Valley, Miami um, approach to tech for health, as opposed to health for, you know, health that has, is digitized. So you effectively, a bit like saying, it's like the, how Tesla has <laughs> taken on the car manufacturing by taking a Silicon Valley sort of mindset to, you're saying a similar sort of thing to health. Yeah, exactly, um, exactly. I would not say Silicon Valley because it's again, very patriarchal, but- uh, No, no not... fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. But I think wherever you have like, um, you know, tech, um, I'll, I'll King's Cross here in London, yeah, yeah. Um, wherever, wherever you have like tech outlays, how, how, how committed and interested they're getting in the health space. And I say this specifically because when you go for funding, the way that funding is done for biotech is done very differently than tech bio. Mm. Um, and the kinds of things that they that investors want to see, they either come at it from a tech perspective or they come at it from a biomedical research perspective. And, and it's just, it's like talking to two different species <laughs> of people. And I think that there's a real rise in the tech bio space uh, coming through. And I think, you know, Sanjay, when we were um, preparing for this, you mentioned um, a specific instance, but I think more broadly, the tech biospace is really interested in how do we treat health and well being without medicine? Yep. So, is it food as a drug? Food as a drug? Is it exercise as a drug? Is it yep. AV, a VR as a drug? You know, there's lots of other things, um, community as a drug. Yep. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you wanted to bring up the diet and fasting points you were making the other day, but I just think tech bio seems yeah. more interested in the, what else besides medicine is there. Just as an NF1, I have been measuring my microbiome for 15 years now. I fast a lot as well, um, nothing religious. It's just, um, I, I happen to know my um, ancestral uh, phenotype. Um, they were very good recorders of who died of uh, what, when, uh, since the late 1700s. It's a very rich phenotype. I may not get sequenced because I think the end game is the phenotype. Um, but understanding that you know, brings a lot of things forward. How do we do this for the rest of the folks uh, and make it kind of a practice, clinical practice, more than, um, more than um, uh, the way drugs are built nowadays? And there's a very interesting... Um, uh, uh, study that said uh, the, the positive outcomes for the top 10 selling drugs are only between 17 and 22 percent. We don't know what happens to the other. And this is, again, the you know, old white men in clinical trials story that we're taking. If you take data science, you're taking a very small portion of that and only studying that and not really um, uh, spreading the goodness, as they say. It's amazing, though, how many longitudinal studies um, and efforts are being launched in the public sector, in sort of the charity space, in the private sector, to try and match up genotypic data, which everyone sort of got into with 23andMe, um, and there's some UK, UK cohorts doing that as well, um, with phenotypic data, because a 10-minute appointment with your GP in the NHS does not give you the opportunity to convey all of the information you could possibly convey. And so it doesn't feel like physicians are getting the full picture, but when you have companies, for example, uh, like Remedy RX, mm -hmm. who are building an app that allow people to, with chronic disease to track long-term symptoms, mood, journaling, and then create sort of a summary for a doctor so that people can see over time 
how how they're feeling and hopefully improve outcomes with not only medicine but also diet and other things yep. but it's really that phenotypic data that doesn't seem to be in any kind of data set at the moment that could really move the needle i i yeah i spent a few years writing an emr system actually writing it from scratch and what what shocked me was um we don't record pain for example uh, there's no way to uh, um, to uh, there's no ontology for pain. We don't really understand it. Maybe it may be quantum biology, but it's so subjective. And but we've never actually measured pain. We measure now um, that that became one of the variables um, um, relation to somebody else in the medical record. So that genetic picture started coming in ICD-11, um, International Classification of Disease, uh, version 11 which is not out there in, in uh, all the medical systems yet. We're still running with ICD-10 right now, but pain as an example. So preventable disease, um, I could name uh, medical errors is on the top of, of, um, of uh, preventable disease or preventable uh, um, uh, outcomes for clinical um, uh, diseases. And then um, uh, basically hyperlipidemia, which is uh, diabetes and, um, and um, and, and pain, pain is the third one, uh, joint replacements, they say, but it's technically pain. And a couple of my orthopedic surgeon friends used to tell me the best cure for pain is to walk it off. And uh, we have gotten into this uh, thing about, you know, a pill that can solve everything, but sometimes it's not. It's interesting, isn't it? I, mean, I, I, I I'm really fascinated by this idea of almost layers of treatment, you know, and particularly going back to the neurological sort of issues, you know, mental health being, you know, being 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 a big one, like just assuming that you should you can medicate the problem away has has obviously created some some significant problems in some parts of society. And this sort of idea that you're talking about, Sanjay, that actually there's and and uh, Amini, you were talking about the sort of exercise and and almost you go and, go and spend time in the community, go and spend time with others, yeah. and nature, go back to your, your parks, yeah, walk more. Yeah, I mean, just this sort of you know, and, 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 but but in a way, almost the tech maybe being the wrapper around all these different parts of the care system you know and, and, and I remember um so me, me and I've got a mutual friend about how we know each other Gareth was telling me a fascinating thing about um you know a, a, an app that can that can that can a companion for a treatment so you're taking a treatment and the app is sort of reminding you oh keep keep going because actually this is around the time that you might feel nauseous or mm -hmm. or you know consider stop taking the medication and I just thought that was fascinating this sort of idea of using in fact, we're all sort of fairly hooked on our devices. Using those devices as part of that sort of care mechanism mm. is, is fascinating, right? Well, that's what I find interesting about. So one, I think more and more the landscape is having to meet the patient where they are, um, as opposed to meeting the doctors where they are. Um, so things like ICD-10 codes, I only know this because I just recently did this, um, going through the symptoms, they make no sense to people who are not doctors, <laughs> like it's not accessible <laughs> at all. And so if you're trying to track your own symptoms in a way that you can then communicate to your GP, you're not on the same page <laughs> from a language perspective. Um, so I think, you know, there's sort of a lot of work being done to meet the patients where they are, whether it's on their devices, whether it's as part of a community or as a companion, there's an amazing um, company called Lark out of Silicon Valley that does an AI nurse for um, diabetes and hypertension lifestyle diseases, essentially saying, why did you eat that Snicker bar? I mean, like it, it can get a bit sassy <laughs> as well with you, but it's, in, it's through WhatsApp, which is a, con a, a comfortable place for a patient to interact and you know, possibly respond better to shame than a nurse in a doctor's office, for yeah. example, you know, or you know, just sort of be more open to lifestyle adjustments to help with their health. And I think there's also this need for more holistic care, not just medicine, not just therapy, not just exercise and diet, but some, you know, magic combination of all of it. And I'm not entirely sure our current healthcare professionals anywhere in the world are set up for success in that way. Uh, and so I think it's gonna fall to the patients to take charge of their own and become CEOs of their own body and uh, really try and bring those various pieces together for themselves. I have a book with me that's by Dr. Han. It's uh, called You Are Here, uh, Discovering the Magic of the Present Moment. And I think, uh, well, by the way, he's, a, he's the father of mindfulness, um, a, a Vietnamese Buddhist priest that 
um, is an international citizen and an honorary doctorate from six countries. Um, so I think, yeah, understanding who you are and understanding that's a small things in life and not money sometimes, you know, that can take a long ways, uh, you a long ways. But uh, uh, the first time I heard the term hospital at home was about a year and a half ago. And um, we all know that, um, you know, we'd rather be in the warmth of our home rather than a cold, sterile environment where, you know, people are in, in all kinds of plastic and looking at you like aliens. Um, and, you know, where is technology going to take you there? And, and how is it going to, uh, I, I think Nina mentioned uh, decentralized or distributed clinical trials. Um, we're kind of getting into this world and even in security, you and I know this, that the world of distributed stuff is becoming more and distributed stuff in technology is very, very hard to put your arms around, uh, pardon the pun. But uh, yeah, so I think it is a challenge both for the technology space and um, for example, if you, if you just take a population slice, I'll, I'll mention the United States. Um, and I was, I was having a, a very interesting discussion with a chief medical officer here in the US. Um, and he re reiterated and uh, confirmed my numbers that uh, about 50% of folks in the United States are what they call the silent generation, the baby boomers and Gen X. That's, that's, a, that's a big chunk of the population that's, gonna, that's either already aged or gonna get old very soon. It's, it's about 150 million plus people in the US, 330 plus million population. <laughs> and 40% uh, are millennials and Gen Zs and only 10% are Gen X. But then if you switch it around to countries like Thailand and India, you know, there are not that many old people because you know, viruses and bacteria are rampant and, um, and there are a lot more younger people. So how do you balance two basic questions in life? Um, how do you define work and how do you define care? And if uh, those are very hairy questions, but um, I think um, I think Mina already mentioned uh, rare disease. Uh, that was the bastard stepchild, pardon my French, but uh, nobody cared about it because it didn't make money. And the population was very vested in the uh, the uh, care of uh, folks with rare disease because they were the champions for them. Um, now we talk about elder care, mental health and pain. I would say, uh, maybe I'm going on a limb here, but I would say viral and bacterial vectors are pretty much the vectors for most chronic disease. Um, after the last pandemic in 1919, um, the incidence of cardiovascular disease and cancer doubled. I would say that is coming as well. So it is not just that we're gonna be slammed because we don't have enough resources, that half our nurse population has resigned and gone, 10% of our physician population has, has left because of stress and, and burnout and so on. But how are you gonna train the next generation of the world to care for people uh, using technology, hopefully? And yeah. I'll leave it at that, but I, I'll yeah. get off my soapbox. <laughs> uh, it's fascinating what you call out around, I suppose, what people are calling long COVID, or at least lay, lay people like, 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 like me, I mean, um, yeah, it, it, you know, it's it, it, yeah, that's sort of fascinating to sort of think about what the other side effects, longer term side effects of of this pandemic. Are, are, so are yeah, SARS-CoV-2 triggers diabetes, by the way, type two diabetes. That was just published in Science two weeks wow. ago. Wow. And this has been another very fascinating study uh, of a person who measured his two thousand proteins plus his whole genome sequence every day for a year. Um, Mike Snyder from from Stanford, uh, a good friend and colleague. And his uh, diabetes, type two diabetes, was triggered by a norovirus, a uh, respiratory virus that is very common. It's in all our skins, actually. And so, if you kind of look at this world where, um, you know, the end game is viral and bacterial, you know, how do you then handle that kind of scale? Is the question. Well, and I think that's where sort of remote healthcare can really play a massive role. So, there's a couple of points I was going to pick up on the on the diminishing resources uh, around healthcare professionals, um, the lack of ability for hospitals to stay open or wards to stay open because of shortages in staff, um, either because of burnout, COVID, immigration, you name it, there's loads war. Uh, of reasons, <laughs> yeah, war, um, is why telehealth is not really a scalable solution, not really. 
I mean, there's you hit a ceiling and you hit a ceiling quite quickly. Uh, and I know I've worked for a couple of telehealth companies that have just haven't been able to keep up with the demand over the pandemic um, because they just weren't able to find the people, the staff, um, the, the, the lines. Um, so interestingly enough, it is about how technology is going to meet that challenge. Mm -hmm. um, are we going to have more 10 minute appointments with AI ML capabilities? Um, will physicians be able to do more with technology augmentation? Will technology replace some of the more rote um, activities, uh, not necessarily the judgments, the medical judgments, but rather the rote activities like collecting a patient history um, or medication history. Um, and so how will technology come up and meet that moment is, is I think something that we're going to see in the relatively near future. On the elder care front, when I say elder care, I think you're right about baby boomers. God help me meet Gen X. Um, but also these people who are going to now suffer longer chronic issues because of COVID, um, long COVID, as I also nascently call it, um, and how technology will meet that moment um, around the need for increased elder care, where person-to-person -person contact may be not an option if there's another pandemic. Um, and I think what's interesting is I think there's a lot of assumptions, and the reasons why we haven't seen a lot of elder tech is there's a lot of assumption that elder, the elderly are not tech-friendly, or savvy, and I'm not entirely sure the data bears that out. Um, but but so also, as the generations age, that that those sort of you know, yeah. stereotypes are no longer should fall off. Exactly, should should, should, should fall off. Don't you? But I'm fascinated by what you're talking about around kind of automating certain tasks in the sort of healthcare industry. Because if you look at if you look at e-commerce and retail and things now, you think how much you know the bots and stuff. Yeah, you, know, you go on a website, your first interaction is with a bot slash maybe a human. You're not entirely sure, you know, whether you're speaking to a, a person or not sometimes when you deal mm -hmm. with these sort of, um, you know, chatbot type uh, um, services. And, and it's fascinating to kind of think that, I guess, regu regulatory changes will probably be needed to allow for technology to do certain sort of more basic diagnostic things. But then, you know, depending on what you read and what sort of philosophy you subscribe to around the whole deep learning, machine learning type, type technologies, you know, some people say, oh, you know, they're not they're, they're not really capable of, of, of things that people say. And then there are other people that say, well, actually, they're far more effective than radio, radiographers at detecting certain certain you know conditions. Then you know, so, so it, it's 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 going to be interesting to see which way which way it goes. I think the, the automation of, like you say, the data collection, maybe and some of the sort of less risky stuff. But hmm. what I'm really interested in is kind of, yeah, how much will diagnosis be assisted by technology? I mean, Sanjay, what are your so, sort of Yeah, um, so just to um, uh, confirm some of the thoughts uh, Mina put forward. Yeah. Uh, I have hard numbers uh, from the United States that show that um, in uh, 2020 uh, and some early parts of 2021, telemedicine grew uh, 6X, so sixfold. Um, but then very quickly, because you couldn't handle it, uh, came back down to earth. Um, it's about one and a half to two X now. It is still double what it was in 2019, but uh, cannot handle the kind of um, uh, uh, flow through that happens. Uh, in, in, uh, I, I used to work in AI for a little while. I used to actually work in radiology as well many years ago. Um, and a very famous neurosurgeon um, said, um, you know, when... When um, a neurosurgeon uh, surgery and radiology fellows um, and neuroradiology fellows, um, you know, uh, come off the uh, green boat, as they say, um, they they used to throw up a film on on a uh, on a on a light box many years ago be before it became digital, and they used to um, uh, uh, kind of downsample from about thousands th a thousand points of data, and it used to take them between so when you're a when you're, you know, you're a fresh physician uh, off the boat, you, you are making decisions with a lot of different points. And, um, and he said, you know, fast forward 20 plus years later, and you look at the same image, let's say it's glioblastoma, uh, you can make a decision within about 10 to 20 milliseconds, only with six to seven data points, with the same image being shown to two different people. Where I'm going with this is two things. One is you cannot compress experience. And there is something beyond, um, uh, we could go down into, into the weeds about 
you know, how uh, adversarial, or adversarial and transfer learning happens. Uh, but, uh, but there is something that is still a, a quite a bit of a gap between what machines can do and what a four-year-old with grammar can do. That's one part. The other part is what is called um, model validation, which is um, in the clinical world, you know, physicians work with, um, you know, uh, basically certainty, some level of certainty by their peers or uh, post hoc. Um, uh, yes, physicians make mistakes. I would say there's a Monday morning meeting in hospitals in the United States. I'm sure the same is true with the NHS, where you say how many mistakes were made last week. <laughs> Um, and medical errors are the largest cause of preventable deaths, um, more so than road accidents and um, uh, death by suicide and some other things combined in the United States. Um, so when you put a machine out there or an algorithm, you know, what is the causal inference piece? How much is observable? And what kind of data are you taking? And if you take the same example with, um, uh, with uh, clinical trials, again, the data out there is very biased. So the question of ethics and bias and model validation are still very tough issues to deal with if you want to automate it fully. And most, most radiologists, radiologists are the first people who accept technologies because they work as a team. Uh, I shouldn't be um, bad saying uh, pathologists here, but pathologists are singletons as they say in the, in the pattern business. Radiologists work well as teams. And so radiologists accept technology first. Some of the most interesting technologies have, uh, have had radiology in, uh, in up front. Um, and then companion diagnostics, you already mentioned that, uh, you know, put other things other than just pills as companions to, to treatment. So let me stop there. But I think we're in early salad days, as Shakespeare used to say. But uh... <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't I don't disagree. One, I think coming back to the diversity and inclusion point that I was making at the very outset, um, it's absolutely true. And all data sets that are fed into any kind of AI algorithm, all these data sets are biased and without knowing their you know origins. Um, it's hard not to to think that there's always going to be some level of bias. I think where AI and ML have been really great. And the, uh, the example I'll give is of Chiron Medical here in the UK, um, who um, have deployed AI technology and mammography. Um, there's a lot of duplication and safeguarding in the medical practice. So for every mammogram, um, one radiologist looks at it and then another radiologist has to look at it before it can get signed off. And um, what Chiron has done is introduced sort of radiologist number two <laughs> in, into the mix with very good results, very, very good results, either confirming in most cases, but also sometimes having a more nuanced look. Um, very few cases, if any, of false positives where radiologist one human um, didn't see anything and ra radiologist two AI <laughs> found something and scared the pants off of a, of a patient um, <laughs> or something like that. So I think, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of duplication and excess, and I think it can help improve efficiency rather than take away medical judgment and experience um, so it's in, the, in the near term. It's intelligence augmentation, isn't thank it? Thank you. I was, uh, thank you for mentioning that. And yes, I would absolutely agree. Process improvement is, uh, is where I think an automation in, in clinical processes are where AI is very well suited. Um, I would say human in the middle is important as well. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, augmentation of the human in the middle is probably where this will go. Yeah, because my because my next point was going to be actually it's it's about machine learning and therefore it's about training with the available data because a lot of the other more fancy solutions we're perhaps seeing in cybersecurity right now are, are deep learning you know, where there's adversarial models that have been built. Now I was just thinking, of course, you can't really have an adversarial model in in life sciences because you can't allow people to die. You know, whilst whilst the machine Control learning population. learns what. What, what, it's you know, a what classic answers. game theory problem, right? It, yeah, it, yeah. There's, a, there's a train coming down the track. There's one bad guy versus 10 good guys. Who are you mm, going to kill yeah. first? We can't, so. we, can't, we can't do that sort of experimentation in, in real life unless we're able to model human, human beings, perhaps virtually. You know, uh, but I will away. always say that you could actually build digital twins. Right. And um, yeah. you have done that with liver models. Um, okay. You are starting to do that with stem cells. You can actually grow your own organs on a, on a, on a slide and mm. do the clinical trial on that organ. So all of that is coming, but uh, I think, yeah. what, what do they say? Um, the, the, um, the, the groundbreaking game-changing thing will take 10 to 20 years, so. Right, right. <laughs> but it's certainly a fascinating space to be in. I mean, we just sort of scratched, scratched the surface here, right? But it's been a fascinating conversation for, for me to kind of, you know, 
there's a curious outsider, like I say, on on on, on this topic, and I'm sure for other people listening as well. But um, perhaps before we close, is there anything me that you would sort of you know sort of say to look out for, or or sort of key sort of things you would highlight for the next sort of year that you think in in the space? Yeah, I think I think sort of um, the last five years has seen a rise in investment in biotech, and I think it's going to shift tech bio a little yeah. bit, um, or more so. I think you'll find that the barriers to entry that people found to be so challenging with drug discovery and development um, will feel lower to non big pharma um, players, whether that's tech companies or other kinds of companies that come to the fore um, to reap the gains and the incredible margins that come with um, health and medicine. Um, and I hope we see a lot more democracy um, in health as a result of improved technology, um, vaccines that are e more easily manufactured and more cheaply produced and therefore more widely distributed, um, patents that are not as restrictive, that are open, open, you know, we, we don't, we haven't gotten to sort of the open access um, world in healthcare as I have in tech. Um, and so that would be something that would be great to see as well with perhaps governments incentivizing, compensating, remunerating companies for making that kind of contribution to public health. Um, so I think that's kind of where I hope and see some things going um, in the health tech space is moving us closer towards the sustainable development goals around health mm -hmm. and really benefiting more people. Thanks, Mina. And the same same question to you, Sanjay, in closing, is there anything you kind of are particularly yeah, attracted um, or excited by? Not in any specific order, but um, I'll rattle off a few things that I've, I've been thinking about. Uh, first is uh, clinical automation. So uh, with low resources, uh, there's gonna be a lot of pressure uh, to automate. I've been hearing this story more and more and more, um, uh, both in government funded healthcare, as well as private uh, healthcare um, countries. There are not that many private healthcare countries, but um, um, I still think healthcare should be a right, not a privilege, but uh, I'll, I yeah, I'll put that flag out there. Uh, the public health, uh, Mina mentioned this already, public health not being the bastard uh, stepchild, uh, curly haired bastard stepchild, but suddenly <laughs> becoming more important. And then I would add preventive care to that as well. Um, AI and uh, model validation for clinical use cases, more and more uh, of that uh, will be important. Uh, I think Mina mentioned this also, remote care platforms for um, uh, chronic, uh, chronic health, women and children's health, mental health, um, understanding of the basic biology. So about a hundred years ago, uh, knowledge increased every hundred years. Now knowledge, uh, knowledge doubled every hundred years. Now knowledge doubles every 70 days in, in biology. And under wow. our understanding of uh, molecular level biology and <laughs> why um, the, the machine behaves the way the machine, we are a machine. Um, uh, so our, that understanding is very important to, to anything that follows. Uh, I would also say clinical security and risk at, at nation scale. I would also throw in biological warfare in there. Um, because healthcare data is go going to become more and more and more important uh, because the, the way war is done will change quite a bit in the next 10 to 50 years. Um, decentralized clinical trials that include women and children, um, precision medicine, which includes non-wealthy nations. Uh, I would also say, you know, slightly longer term issues like hospital at home and food as medicine. Let me stop there. Well, there's plenty more. Perhaps we need to, we need to do another follow up but i mean because because what's just occurred to me is the whole you know cybersecurity angle in in health healthcare as well so perhaps sanjay that's something that we, we can certainly do and meaning you'll be more than welcome to join us for, for for that conversation but look i know the pair of you are both super super busy i know mina you are massively oh subscribed so well done on on on, on things in in your world and so thank you both for your time it's been a great conversation and i look forward to speaking to you again soon thanks for thank having you. us cheers thanks, <laughs>